must now move to questions to the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure. I inform the House that questions 2, 10 and 13 have been withdrawn. We will then start with listed questions and I call Mrs Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 1, please. I thank the member for her question. Uh, museums have advised me that the range of literature sold through its outlets is reflective of the collections and exhibitions held each year of the organization, at the organisation's three sites. The sale of books and other literature is part of museums' retail operations and is intended to enhance the understanding of its collections and exhibitions and also help generate income for the organisation. They have also informed me that its retail operations are not of themselves subject to equality proofing and cultural monitoring. This is because they are aligned to the Museums and Galleries Northern Ireland Order 1998 and the Museums Policy for the North. The Museums and Galleries Order requires both uh, the, the Board of Trustees and the Museums to assist the public to interpret the significance of its collections and exhibitions. The Museums Policy specifically requires uh, museums here to embrace the principles of equality of opportunity and develop good relations beyond any legislative requirement to do so. This policy was subject to equality proven by my department. Ms. Hale for supplement. I thank the Minister for her in-depth answer and as a very keen supporter of the Culture, Arts and the Ulster Museum, I was very disappointed on Easter Monday when I visited with my daughter to find a distinct bias in the books on, and literature for sale in the shop of all things of a nicest and republican nature, items of British, Ulster Scots or Orange or even the wartime were practically non-existent, thus providing a one-biased or one-sided view. I have spoken with the Ulster Scots Community Network and they have informed me that, ne that neither they or the Ulster Historical Foundation have ever been contacted by DECAL or the museums in relation to literature being sold at the museum and having subsequently revisited the museum on Friday. Can the Minister tell me who makes the decision and the choice of literature displayed and sold and what steps are being taken to, to ensure the balanced view, including the arrival of the Vikings, the Normans and the plantations are being, being exhibited at our museums? Well, I'm disappointed that the member wasn't uh, happy with her visit or indeed with the exhibitions uh, or the literature sold, um, and I'm happy to write to the museum to that effect. Um, I, I am concerned that given the amount of money that we put into the MAGAS, over three and a half million pounds, uh, for specifically to enhance and enrich the literature and the cultural um, uh, services and facilities to places like the museums, that, 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 that we've all fell short. So, Happy to write uh, to the museums with the members' <coughs> concerns, and certainly happy to write to them uh, querying this, and also querying what the Ulster um, uh, Network, the Ulster Scots Network, and the Ulster Historical Foundation have been doing with the money that they've received to do exactly this. Mr. Patchy. Um, I wonder, could the Minister advise us on uh, other themes uh, covered by the literature that's sold by the museums? Um, well, just, just as a few examples, there are, um, I have been informed by the museums, the Ulster Museum in particular, that there are um, literature uh, and examples on archaeology, there are some on art, some on dinosaurs and prehistoric life. There are some in farm life and there are some in geology and nature and wildlife. Um, but I'm happy to try and furnish the member, and indeed with Mrs Hale, a full list of all the exhibits available uh, to be sold in the shop. Ms Cara McKenna. Well, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, um, is there, under the, the Museum's 1998 uh, order, does the Culture, Arts and Leisure Department um, have a role to play in the process of how uh, the museums um, display and, and um, the range of books um, that are available to, uh, to buy? Uh, in short, no, we don't, because that's why the museums councils are to inform the Ulster Museums of, first of all, certainly in terms of trends, but even just in terms of the, the authenticity of some of the exhibitions and indeed some of the articles that need to be done. But the museums in the past have responded to demands as well. And if anyone has any concerns about what should be there rather than what's not there, but, but also what's not there, I, I believe that the museums will respond in a positive fashion. Um, but for me to interfere in what exhibitions should or shouldn't be there, I believe it would be wholly inappropriate 
for a minister to interfere, or any politician for that matter, to interfere in what exhibitions have, certainly have an opinion, but direct interference, in, in my opinion, is nothing short of censorship. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, I know uh, last year a number of curator vacancies were not filled. Can I ask the Minister if now we have enough curators to man all our museums? Um, I prefer the term staff the museums, Anna, but I'll let you off with that one. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's a short and honest answer. I know the creators <coughs> and the specialists that we have at our disposal through the three museum sites are um, second to none. You know, they've got really very, very good reputations, both locally, nationally and internationally. But I'm happy to write uh, and happy to raise that uh, query with the museums and certainly write to a member, given the details that she's queried. Call Mr. Trevor Clark. Question number three. Thank the member for his question. Uh, my department is working closely with the Locks Agency and Inland Fisheries Ireland, jointly developing and promoting the recreational angling product here, including South Antrim through its participation in key angling shows throughout Ireland, Britain and Europe. DECAL also attends the Irish Game Fair held at Shane's Castle in the member's own constituency in Antrim. Uh, the event attracts a considerable number of visitors and DECAL promoted a number of new initiatives to encourage greater interest in angling, particularly amongst children and young people. In South Antrim, my department manages Stony Ford Reservoir and Tomb Canal, which are very popular waters for anglers within the DECAL's public angling estate, and there are also a number of private fisheries in South, Ant South Antrim, including the Six Mile Water and the Lower Ban. Clark for supplementary. Thank you, the Minister, for an answer. And I, mean, I, I do notice that the DECAL are fairly active within that area. However, given the direction of her colleague, our ministerial colleague in relation to DARD, um, can you, Minister, give any assurance to those within the fishing sector who actually have reservoirs, and you did refer to one, who may now be at risk and their business at risk because of the actions of the Reservoirs Bill. What assurance can you give them that maybe you will help in terms of assistance to fund them, uh, given that they will maybe not have the capability of funding them themselves? Well, the, the member already is aware that I, I'm only responsible for the public angling estate. Some of the, the, the waters that I mentioned, particularly one, is a private concern. Um, and in relation to the reservoirs, I actually lease the fishing rights of the owners. Um, at the minute, my understanding is, and the member will be much more across this issue than I am, that when it comes to public safety, and particularly in health and safety, that there's no regulations. So that's part of the understanding of bringing the reservoir bill forward. But certainly, if the member has any concern about a particular fishery, albeit public or private, I'm happy to meet with them and hear the concerns, because the last thing that I want for people, particularly through Indigenous uh, work like fisheries in England that that's precedes generations that people not only are put out but they're put out for this and future generations ahead. So I'm happy to meet with them to have those discussions. Ms. Sandra Overend. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I wonder um, can the Minister provide an update uh, considering the importance of angling uh, in South Antrim and, and also uh, touching on Loch Ness, can the Minister provide an update on uh, the study to establish the baseline of the fish population in Loch Ness? Well, I'll, again, I'll write to a member because I'm liaison with my colleague Michelle O'Neill on this and actually working with the Loch Ness partnership and other concerns, including some of the councils. As a member, we aware of our own constituency, um, neighbours Loch Ness, but many others do. Um, but I have to say that see, all the discussions, there's literally a, a cigarette paper between everyone. First of all, to ensure that the Loch Ness is preserved, to ensure that all fishing rights recreational leisure, you know, opportunities like that, as well as looking at, uh, I suppose, future potential, not only about future leisure opportunities, but in, indeed some of the, the leisure and economic regeneration for that area. But again, um, I'll write to the member with details after consultation with my colleague, Michelle O'Neill, on the question that she's raised. Mr. John Rogers. And thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, in terms of angling, there's a great wee niche market there in terms of developing uh, the tourist potential right, right across the whole area. What are you doing as Minister to promote angling as a sport? Well, so we're, we're, 
even through Sport and I, well before my time, but certainly even from my time, we've been working very closely with the governing body of England, indeed some of the, the various Anglican clubs across the north and indeed even across the island. I mean, even in my own colleague's constituency of West Tyrone, uh, Dagla McAleer up in Loch Macquarie is an example, uh, held uh, the Junior Anglin Trout International uh, competition. There are many others across the board, particularly when young people are getting involved. And the review in the Anglin recently had something like almost 30 recommendations and one of them is to help support not only the sport of Anglin with the clubs, but even for others who haven't really found Anglin yet to try and encourage them into it. So uh, hats off to the Anglin community, they're doing very well, but certainly what has been missing in the past, a greater collaboration and cooperation and indeed a partnership with government. And I think that report certainly would give us the, the opportunity to try and bridge some of those gaps, but make it actually better for the Anglin community across the whole island. Well, Mr. Sean Lynch. Okay, let's have a question for <coughs> I thank the member for his question. Uh, libraries, as a member may be aware, need to complete a business case aimed at securing the necessary resources for the development of a new and improved library. And Anna Skilmer Fort will be in a position to present any plans to me uh, on suitable locations for the facility. Work on this business case is underway, and uh, I do expect that uh, exercise be completed by November of this year. And the possibility of relo relocating the existing library to the old <coughs> Urn Hospital site and sharing with other public sector organisations, for example, like the South West Regional College, is actively being considered as part of that business case process. This process also requires that the benefits of any relocation be fully tested and evaluated <coughs> alongside a range of other potential options. Some of these options, and indeed one of them, will be that the library should remain in its current site, and there are many others, which is readily accessible to the <coughs> centre and the entire population of Enniskillen and beyond, and where the library has already built up a strong and valued presence in the community. Before I call Mr Dunn. Just to say, Minister, that the new library opened in Listen Ski on the May the 8th, and it's a fantastic facility for the town, and I look forward to yourself coming to open it officially. But regarding Enniskillen, does the Minister recognise the library uh, and its importance to the county, and that there is an, an urgent need for its improvement? Well, I thank, I thank the member for his kind remarks. Um, I mean, Enniskillen is Romana's um, main and largest library uh, currently, and I do recognise that there is a need to provide that service, particularly uh, given the size of the county. I mean, libraries uh, and I have estimated that um, it's, I mean, it serves a catchment population of around 60,000 people, and that's, that's quite big. Uh, uh, I am aware that the condition of the building is deteriorating, uh, and usable space within the library is limited uh, and certainly I'd be concerned about the heritage collections and their need for better storage and certainly I know libraries and I share those concerns. Uh, so it is for these reasons that we have uh, encouraged uh, libraries and I to develop this business case uh, to look at these deficiencies and certainly as I said in the main answer to look at uh, the options for any new relocation or new library in the future. Before I call the next member, can I remind those who are seeking or rising in their chair looking for a question that this is a very specific question, specifically to one site? Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister. And uh, I think we all recognise the importance of libraries, and all libraries, including the libraries in Fermanagh, will need books. So, therefore, can the Minister? give us an assurance that she will endeavour within the financial year to find funding to provide stock for all libraries across Northern Ireland, including Fermanagh and North Down. I congratulate the member on his uh, ingenuity in weaving not only Fermanagh and North Down on one breath. The member will, well, the member will be aware that I, uh, from the the budget settlement that we received, which has fell far short of where it needs to be, um, that, I, that I prioritise libraries within the DECAL family. And at 7.5%, when the rest of 
for example, arts and sports and museums received a much higher uh, cut to their budget. Uh, and within that uh, protection included stock, and not only stock, but the availability to use uh, computers and broadband through the uplift in the, in the E2 system. So um, I, I am uh, confident that Libraries and I will ensure that the stock in Fermanagh and your constituency doesn't uh, drop. And if, if certainly um, I'll ask uh, Libraries and I specifically about the stock in those two constituencies that, that you mentioned uh, and right to you with the answer for same. Call Mr. John Dalla. Deputy Speaker, the Minister will of course know that there's a very long and rich history to the library in, in a skill and a recognition that historically people couldn't afford uh, to buy their own books. Is the, is the Minister committed to that same principle at the turn of the century and can she assure us it will apply across the north? I certainly can give that commitment to the member because it is important. I mean, we, we, we met a group uh, last night, a group of kids from North Belfast and the Shankill who went to South Africa, and they were telling us that children can't access education unless they have a pair of shoes and the parents can't afford to buy shoes. What we need to make sure is parents who can't afford to buy books, that the, them and their family and indeed their community are disadvantaged, and that's why libraries are there. And that's at the core of the business of libraries. So I want to ensure that if people need books, either just for their own pleasure or even to help them with study or further education or help them with exams, that libraries will do that. And libraries have done a very good job thus far in doing that. And I have no reason uh, to believe that they won't continue that. Call Mr. Cathal O'Shea. Uh, Corbyn, I've got the brief last question. Corbyn, I've got the brief last question. Thank the member for his uh, question. Both academies uh, will have an important role to play in the enhancement and development of their respective languages, their culture, and indeed the development of the academies. In relation to Irish, there is a need for an academy which will address the range of issues and gaps in terms of the teaching, learning, and acquisition and use of the Irish language, particularly in relation to adults. Uh, in terms of Ulster Scots, the Ministerial Advisory Group for Ulster Scots Academy has developed as part of its remit, uh, options and a preferred proposal for the creation of a physical Ulster Scots Academy to maximise the social, economic and community and cultural benefits of Ulster Scots. And further to progress the development of the academies, I plan to conduct a separate public consultation, consultations to ensure that the public and indeed stakeholders have their say in what both academies Will seek to achieve. Come, Mr. Ocean, first supplementary. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. 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 Good morning, the Magus uh, Ministerial Advisory Group on Ulster Scots uh, was established in March uh, 2011. What has been achieved by that group since? Good morning. Um, well, the member probably heard me make some mention to Mrs. Hale about the, the number or the amount of money that's been spent on the, the Ministry of Advisory Group Mr. Scott so far. It's actually, to correct myself earlier, it's 3.4 million rather than 3.5 million. And the department has provided 3.4 million to the Ministerial Advisory Group over the past four years. And this has enabled, enabled a, a, a wide range of uh, achievements, including the development of and research strategy for the Ulster Scots sector, uh, a, a comprehensive business case for the options around the Physical Academy, uh, the new Ulster Scots Hub and Discovery Ulster Scots Centre Corn Exchange at the Cathedral Quarter, uh, which I opened in November of last year, uh, and 76 projects which have been funded by the MAG uh, across three work streams of language and literature, education and research, and history and heritage and culture. Um, certainly acknowledge that work's been done uh, so far, and there's still much work to be done. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answer so far. I uh, understand the Minister has said in terms of work with the Magus. Can I ask the Minister, has she held scheduled minute meetings with the Ulster Scots Agency? Have there been action points from those meetings with the Ulster Scots Agency with outcomes in relation to the establishment of an Ulster Scots Academy across Northern Ireland and indeed the border counties as well? 
Well, I haven't had any formal meetings with Ulster Scots Agency about an Ulster Scots, um, but the, the Magus, um, because at this stage the Ministerial Advisory Group in Ulster Scots just uh, reports to the department directly. Uh, but I will be involved in the Ulster Scots Agency in the future work of the Magus because I intend to do a review into the Magus. Uh, although I extended uh, the Ministerial Advisory Group in Ulster Scots until next year, I intend to shorten that. Uh, review our intention to shorten that extension to December of this year and conduct a review of the functions of the Ministerial Advisory Group between now and then. And I would certainly envisage that the Ulster Scots Agency would have a role in the future of the Ulster Scots Ministerial Advisory Group. Call Mr. Patsy McGraw. Uh, I got a free last young call. You. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Well, let me just case the car there in Ira. My son to go well, Ian Bush had like he had Latif Adiv one who. The Nakadav. Um, could I ask the Minister, has she set aside any particular budget uh, in relation to the establishment of the academies? The short answer is no. Uh, what we, we uh, conducted was the scoping studies, the initial scoping studies from DCAL's budget for both Ulster Scots Academy and Anakadu for the Irish language. Um, what I think we need to do now is to go out for full public consultation separately on both. Because I believe that there's many within the sector or sectors have opinions on what they, sh what sh the academy should have, but I'd like to hear from stakeholders, including parents and practitioners in education, people who are responsible for, in the case of the Irish language, language acquisition, um, and even you know examples of what's happened in the rest of the island and indeed in Europe. Um, once that happens, then certainly I would envisage that business cases for both will be brought forward, and there will be substantial monies. That will be asked for. I mean, you're talking well over 20 million, I'd imagine, for both. Call Mr. David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Happy Speaker. Question six. Uh, Previous can call your uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. With your permission, I'll group questions six, seven, and eleven together, uh, and thank the member for bringing the question forward. The Windsor Park project is currently under construction and work is progressing well. Reconstruction of the pitch, which commenced in May uh, 2014, was completed in August last year. Demolition of the south stand is now complete and construction of the east and south stands has commenced and again is progressing well. On Tuesday, 31st of March, uh, the department was notified by the IFA that there was a structural problem with the existing west stand. Since this date, DECAL have been in close liaison with the IFA on this matter, and on the 20th of April, the board of the IFA met to ratify the recommendation um, that uh, the state project from the project team that the West Dam be demolished following recent structural damage. This recommendation came after a series of meetings with all interested parties, and following the review of a structural engineer's report, de de demolition work will begin immediately. And in addition, the upcoming UEFA Euro 2016 qualifier against Romania on Saturday, 13th of June 2015, will be played at Windsor. The project team has produced a plan which should enable the necessary capacity to be met for this game by accelerating work on the project in the East Stand, South East Quadrant, and South Stand. I am glad every effort is being made to ensure that the international game scheduled for the 13th of June will take place in Windsor Park as planned. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And having declared the, the relevant interest of question six, can I ask that th there is a slight concern out there within the fr football fraternity in relation to cost moving forward? Can the minister guarantee that if there is extra money required for Windsor Park, that the remainder of the regional stadium money is still available and won't be touched? Well, um, the the member will be aware, because he, he, he was at the CAL committee last week when either him or one of his colleagues asked a question of one of my officials about who would fund the, the provision of the West End. And it is my understanding that that will come from insurance, that that won't impact on the budget that we have set aside for Windsor Park and indeed for the development of the sub-regional stadium thereafter. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the Minister has referred to that it will be insurance will pay for the stand. Can she give any indication as to when she expects the New York Cup stand to be completed if we have to wait on the insurance panel? Uh, I don't anticipate um, to get uh, or any of us to have the, um, 
the difficulty of sitting and waiting to go through the bureaucracy of any insurance claim. I think there is an acceptance that uh, issues and certainly structural damage was done to the West End. Uh, the contractor, who's um, coincidentally the contractor, the same con construction firm that's looking at both the Olympia and Windsor Park redevelopment. Uh, so it makes it actually easier. So there's no contest between one set of contractors and another, or one owner and another. Um, but notwithstanding that, I expect to hear certainly next week, this time next week, if not sooner, not only that it is resolved, but also a date on not only because I understand that demolition work. Well, it needs to start. It needs to start as soon as possible, uh, and that, that will start. And then thereafter, we'll get a timetable for, time for the demolition work, plan permission, and then the work to be completed on the cop stand. Call Mr. George Robinson. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, could the minister confirm if the stand will be ready for 2016, or even before 2016? Well, 2016 starts on the 1st of January 2016, so I, I'm assuming that the member is asking, will the, will the West End be completed in line with the overall project? It would be my anticipation that that, that is the case and that if there's any delay in the overall timeline, that it's a very, very small delay. I mean, I think everybody in this House accepts that the IFA, in particular soccer fans, are put in a terrible position that the hurt what happened, but I think we're all very, very thankful that no one was injured or hurt because given what happened a few days earlier, I think we're all just very thankful that we could have been dealing with the worst situation. So I'm, I'm actually I, I'm encouraged by the attitude that everybody's taken. Everybody's taking a can-do attitude. We've got a big problem. We all know we need to fix it. And above all else, we need to make sure that people, particularly the IFA and the soccer community, aren't uh, penalised as a result of something that happened and that the overall redevelopment of Windsor Park happens without too much delay. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Stadium. Can the Minister outline when the original business case was brought forward and was the safety technical group involved in the initial proposal for the three stadium? Um, well, the Sport and I appointed um, FGS McClure and Waters in October 2009 to prepare an outline business case on behalf of the three governing bodies. The OBC was submitted to DFP by DECAL in October 2010. Um, and the OBC, the Outland Business Case, was approved uh, by DFP on the 7th of March 2010. Um, and, and that includes the current safety technical arrangements. Um, the, the same groups were involved in that process then as they are now. So hopefully that help. Call Ms. Sander Overend. Thank you. Question 8, please. Thank the member for her question. I met with the Chair of the Arts Council in advance of budget reductions being implemented and asked that in considering funding uh, applications for 2015-16 that the Arts Council would seek to ensure the frontline services were protected. My officials continue to liaise with Arts Council and affected organisations following the communication of the Arts funding decisions for 2015-16 to discuss other potential funding sources or opportunities for collaboration and partnership which would allow programmes to continue to be delivered, albeit in an alternative way. I fully recognise that the value that the arts can bring to individuals, communities, the economy and indeed the wider society. I continue to promote this value and I'm bringing forward an arts and cultural strategy which will emphasise the importance of arts and culture in creating a cohesive society and contributing to positive health and wellbeing in protecting tourism or promoting tourism helping the economy and acting as a driver for the creative industries and indeed for artistic excellence. It must be a very quick supplementary, Ms. O'Brien. Okay, thank you and thank the Minister. Would the Minister agree that given the arts sector, including the performing arts, is a major contributor to the health and well-being of our, our people I, and serious efforts do need to be made to deliver the finance needed for this sector? Quick answer. Quick answer. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, and to that end, that's why we're bringing an overarching strategy where all the departments can help actually contribute to the arts and indeed to the economy. 
That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions, and I call Mr. Chris Lill. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the contribution of the Eastside Arts Festival to the growth of the arts, social and economic regeneration in East Belfast, and whether her department has been able to invest in this fantastic festival? Well, I totally agree with everything the member has said, uh, and, and indeed, DECAL have, and through the Arts Council, have contributed to the Eastside Arts. Uh, Eastside Arts are one of the cultural partners. They've been working together certainly well before the World Peace and Fire Games, but along with other cultural partners, put on a brilliant exhibition, and they continue to do excellent work, certainly in the east, east of Belfast. Mr. Little, first supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask then, given the significant public support for maintaining uh, the 2014 15 level of public funding for the arts? Can the Minister say how she proposes to secure an appropriate level of funding for the arts and creative industries in Northern Ireland? Well, certainly in relation to Eastside Arts, Eastside Arts are one of the groups that was awarded funding that never really received the level of funding that they had before. Unfortunately, the situation is with other groups who received funding previous to groups like the Eastside Arts were unhappy that new groups received money because their uh, budget was either reduced and some small group of groups didn't receive any support at all from the Arts Council. Uh, I, I, I know myself that they're very, extremely disappointed and it is important that there is an overall recognition, not only the role that arts and culture have to play, and certainly the role that creative industries have to play, not play, for make it, play in terms of making people feel better about themselves, about their communities, but also they actually have a regeneration uh, contribu contribution to the economy, to education, to further skills. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think it's worth noting that hopefully when this overarching strategy is brought to the executive, I'm hoping that all parties will give it support. Question number two has been withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Pat Ramsey is not in his place. I call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Garmaga, I approve in the last call to put it to the Minister. The Minister is well aware of the uh, Carriage of Joe group in Armagh and, and them trying to provide a cultural hub in the Armagh City area. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, could the Minister give us maybe a wee update on that project, please? Carmela Margaret. Um, well, thank the member for his uh, question. I mean, I, I have. Uh, along with others, including Koshin and Esiakta, some of the local councils, some of the lottery funding and other sources of funding have uh, had a series of meetings with our officials, both in DECAL and, and officials from, in the case of Armagh Council, and indeed Koshin and Esiakta, about looking at Karjacha and other cultural hubs, because they do and will have uh, a, a great opportunity to provide a cultural space for people in the community but also to act as small, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so everything is working. Uh, everyone's working collectively to try and have Carter Chaw achieved. And indeed, not just you know, for the here and now, but to make them economically sustainable for the future. Mr. Boylan, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal. I have to could I thank the Minister for that uh, detailed answer. And she recognises the value of the project, but could the Minister um, keep me updated on the project? and also maybe consider uh, meeting the group as this project uh, grows in the future. Well, sir, happy to meet. I mean, the member will be aware I've met groups from his consistency before, so I'm happy to meet groups from across the board. have done and will continue to do that. I am aware that even just recently, within a matter of maybe days, that my officials have been liaising with the, the group, uh, Karja Cha and uh, Ardwaha, and will continue to do that. They're working very closely together to help meet them deadlines in terms of funding and to actually help them shape up the development and the proposal. They're working with other partners, including Cushion and the SJACTA, and also working with partners, as I mentioned before, in our Mass City Council. Uh, so happy to meet the member uh, with the group and indeed others uh, about this development. Very positive for that area and very, very positive for culture. Well, Ms. Michaela Boyle. Um, the Minister may not be familiar with Gorchen Glen in West Tyrone, uh, a beautiful part uh, not only of this island but indeed uh, West Tyrone. There is a huge potential within Gorchen Glen to develop um, opportunities for, 
for facilities around physical and leisure activity, much in the same way that there is in the Tullymoor Forest Park. Uh, can the Minister agree uh, to meet with me and others in relation to have a discussion around how to further develop this, this beautiful park in West Rhone? Gourmet Mayogut. Um, happy to meet with the member and indeed uh, representatives and groups around this issue. I'm not familiar uh, with Gorch and Glen, although I'm, I'm aware of the proposal, um, uh, but certainly happy to meet the member uh, to discuss it. I actually believe that the work that we've done around our waterways, and particularly if you look at the experience, as a member has mentioned, Tullymore, and even what we discussed earlier, Loch Ness, in terms of angling, happy to use our natural resources to try and build and develop opportunities around physical activity, leisure activities, but also uh, cultural and community and festival opportunities around that. So uh, delighted to, to uh, meet the members' request about meeting people who have no doubt are going to tell me how beautiful Gorchin Glen is. Ms Boyle for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response and indeed look forward to her uh, visiting uh, Gorch and Glen sometime in, in, in the future. And my office will liaise with her private office to arrange a mutual agreement uh, time and date for that meeting, Gormaga. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what tangible and actual steps? has the Minister taken to enable boxers from Northern Ireland who aspire to compete for Great Britain and Northern Ireland to actually achieve that aspiration? Well, I have encouraged the, the governing bodies of the boxing to actually talk to each other. Uh, Sport and I have also done the same, and the member will be aware of a report uh, of a group who uh, done an investigation into allegations around sectarianism and boxing, and as a member is aware that those that, that report uh, reported on, and made recommendations about how to improve relations, but certainly did not substantiate some of the allegations. And one of the things, one of the recommendations, come from that report, and indeed from other conversations, was about children who identify themselves as either Irish or British. Uh, that they should have the opportunity to box uh, for the governing body of their choice. So that is where it rests. Other than ensuring that those conversations happen, uh, trying to facilitate them as best possible, that's as much as I can do. Mr Alistair, first supplementary. Apart from apparently claiming to endorse the aspiration, is it not pretty clear that the minister hasn't actually done anything tangible to advance the matter? and it is still not advanced, despite it being a crying need to be met for many, many years. And the Minister surely just seems comfortable with that position. Well, unlike the member, I don't use the floor of the Assembly to make criticisms, assertions, or indeed even make allegations um, and not substantiate them. I've, I've went above and beyond to ensure that children, regardless who they are, how they describe themselves, how they identify themselves, have actually used the legislation within the 1998 Good Friday Agreement to ensure that children can compete and represent a country or a nation of their choice. Uh, so uh, I, wasn't advi I, I don't need to be advised by the member about what I need to do. I know what my responsibilities are. However, the member should be aware that the majority, and I would say the overwhelming majority, of children and young people who wish to progress their amateur careers through boxing wish to do it through the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. And I believe that it's adults like himself who are politically driven to ensure the children who want to box for Ireland, who perhaps come from Protestant Unionist loyalist areas, are making it really difficult. And what he should do is support them and not get political about who the box for or who the representative compete for. We all need to get behind our athletes, regardless of how they identify themselves. And I think the children and young people have been much more mature in the way they've approached this than people like you, Mr. Alistair. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, uh, what efforts her department are making to promote participation in sport for those with physical dis disabilities? 
Well, certainly I've had uh, a, gr a very good relationship uh, with Disability Sport NI and will continue to have. Um, and I know there were concerns uh, previously about the budget reductions, and I believe that they're working, both Disability Sport NI and Sport NI are working those three, and indeed my officials are working through those as well. But it is really important that, and I just want to let the member know, I'm sure she is aware, but the three governing bodies, Ulster Council of GAA, uh, Ulster Rugby and the Irish Football Association have done excellent work in addition to what Disability Sport and I have done in terms of including children and young people and even adults with disabilities into those sports. I think we're doing well, but there's always much more that we can do. Mrs Cameron for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. I recently had the privilege to meet with the Ulster Bavarians, um, the only club of its type in Northern Ireland, who meet at the Antrim Forum each week um, to play wheelchair rugby. Um, can the Minister tell us what her department can do to support the good work of clubs such as this and to uh, ensure that there are more clubs of this? type set up so that the, the disabled community have the appropriate access to sport? I mean, aware of the group and aware of the, the work uh, that goes on, particularly in our own consistency um, around disabilities. I, I mean, I, I do believe in, the, in particular because she's raised rugby as an example, but it's really around disability and access. I mean, the work that the three governing bodies, as well as disability and I have done and promoting uh, sport and physical activity for people with disabilities is great. But I will give her an assurance that I will continue to ensure that disabilities are protected as best possible. It's access for sport and arts and culture and creativity, particularly for people with disabilities, is protected as best possible. And not even that, that the governing bodies who receive probably 84% of participation of any sport across uh, the north and indeed across the island will continue to do their good work uh, particularly around rugby, Gaelic and soccer with, with groups and um, working in conjunction with schools and disability and I. Call Mr Cathal O'Shea. Uh, I've got a, a brief uh, last thing to uh, The Minister will be more than aware that the consultation into the draft Act in the Gaelica ends next week. And uh, can I put on record uh, the work of Conor in the Gaelica, uh, Glor in the Mona, August Imel Chanter Hain, Kushja Forbaha, Karen Tahar, Glor Liam Awadi, August Glor Dungiven, and many others who have worked with groups and individuals around us. Can she ensure that feedback to all is provided at the earliest opportunity after the consultation re responses have been analysed? Gorba, I've got a brief last thing to um, well, I will give the member assurance that the will, all the groups who will respond, uh, will be given feedback. Uh, the, the consultation closes next Tuesday, the 5th of May. Uh, I encourage everybody to feed into that consultation. Um, but certainly the groups that he's mentioned, and I'm sure there are many others out there, uh, particularly for their work with children, young people and families, is exemplary, and that they are exemplars. Um, and I have no doubt that they will feed into that consultation, but there's still a week left. It's not too late for others to do so. Mr. Christian for a supplementary. Uh, and like her, I would uh, uh, express that wish as well that uh, there is time for people uh, to take the opportunity to respond to the consultation. Uh, but can I ask the Minister that her and Department will ensure that feedback off the draft bill is provided in detail and brought before the entire Assembly? Certainly, I'm happy to do that. I mean, the member is a, uh, a member of the, the CAL committee. And he will get that as well. But I think it's important. People feed into consultations and don't know where it goes after that. I mean, that, that is one of the big criticisms across the board. So um, I understand that. And uh, in Dimnaco Humlin, I totally agree with you that we need to ensure that not only is there feedback, that people, if there were themes and there were trends as part of consultation, that that's shared with the entire community. Because if people take the trouble to respond to a consultation, particularly if they do it, on the basis that they're being positive, they're entitled to hear what the response is, not just in terms of their points, but to other points as well. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. <coughs> Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far. Would the Minister accept that there's an unfortunate phrase creeping into government speak now, which is counter strategic, which effectively is allowing departments and others to say, listen, we feel your pain, but we've got no money. So notwithstanding the decision that Queen's made around the festival, would the Minister agree that it, there is an onus on her and her department to ensure that festivals which provide great value in terms of culture and tourism uh, and, and all of the other added benefits, there's an onus on her department to ensure that the festival succeeds and is fully funded? 
Well, um, it's not my responsibility to fund the Queen's <laughs> Festival. The Queen's Festival do receive substantial money from the Arts Council, uh, and I mean, their contribution, the Arts Council's contribution to the Queen's Festival remains. It is regrettable. The Queen's University made their decision. And I, and I, not being flippant, I do feel the pain of the festival organisers because it's one of the, the brands that we have had come back decades. And certainly there is a onus on the community. I mean, I spoke to Queen's people who have went to the Queen's Festival who are very adamant and who are very resilient, but are also very determined to ensure that that festival continues, albeit in a different form. And I'm sure the member will agree with me. It's important that we give them all our support, but I can't fund that gap. Order. Time is up. That concludes question time. I invite members to take their ease while we change the top table.